Welcome everyone to today's author interview with Premi Mohammed, who um, you might have uh, read the books of. If you've come to our book group, you might have read Apple Tree Throne, um, or you might have read as well Beneath the Rising. Um, but today <laughs> we're going to be talking to Premi about some of her other works as well. And we're going to be hearing an extract from one of her newest books. So I'm going to hand over to Premi to read a little bit and give us a taste for what she's writing and what she's doing. Thank you so much. Um, this is from These Lifeless Things, which is a novella from uh, Rebellion that came out in February, and it's uh, told by two narrators. So I'm going to read uh, the, a bit from the first narrator and then a bit from the second narrator. April 28th. Today, we dug up bones in the botanical garden. I was briefly reflexively confused. How did these get here? But what a question. People just die wherever they die. He stopped digging too, and we studied our findings. Brown, glistening, not white and dry like in the movies. For a moment, I thought my eyes had tricked me, and we had found a layer of uh, mulch, or wood, a sculpture carved by some macabre but competent art student. Bone fragments fell on the trays at my feet, the strawberry runners we had scavenged from the wall yesterday. I just wanted something sweet. I haven't had anything sweet for a long time. B poked the skull with his boot and said, the grass in cemeteries, they say, stays green even in a drought because it drinks from the bodies of the dead. I said, who says that? That's disgusting. He laughed and I put my hand on his warm back in the black shirt. He start, he's strong. There's still muscle along with the bone. And I thought, we could make love right here in the sun right under the gaze of God, who in this dead city would stop us? But well, we planted the strawberries and more beans and weeded the potatoes. In the fussy, preciously laid out Mediterranean gardens, we scraped aside the white gravel, laying bare of the black fabric below in another SOS sign. Was satisfying, that noise. No one's coming, I said. Still, said B. The soil rumbled and churned under our boots, not with the vigor of spring seedlings, nor worms or springtails or mice. Faceted, iridescent eyes watched us. A tiny tentacle lunged up and tugged impishly at my laces. D spun it once and killed it with a blow from the spade. I thought at least the soil had been spared, he said. We'll see who spares who if they touch my strawberries, I said. A good day's work, no sentinel seam. About half the remaining trees have turned, but watched us rather than attacking. We scrambled back to safety just before sundown, sweaty and thirsty as always, joyously locked the doors and pulled the shutters behind us. Dark now, something scrabbling on the street below. Hmm. Emerson. The botanical gardens, the botanical gardens. Quick, where is that on the map? Pull it up, check the drone photos. Emerson? I looked up, dazed. What? We're, uh, we're just breaking for lunch. Do you want to come? I lower the book to my lap with trembling hands. I should be wearing gloves. No, wait. The scanner can filter out my fingerprints, but that means I'll have to wait until I am. Winnie stoops and taps my wrist briskly with her sharp painted fingernail. The pain is bright and minute as a wasp sting and brings me back to myself, back to the cool gloom, the ceaseless breeze. The patch of sunlight I've been sitting in all morning has become shadow, violet and even scarlet around the edges from the dust in the air. Are you all right? I found, I think I found, I correct myself professionally, I think I may have found a, a primary source. Christ, are you sure? No, I don't know. I'm cradling the book, I realize, in both hands, close to my torso, as if I've picked up a small animal. There's no date. The book itself was published 50 years pre-setback, but it talks about the sentinels, about things in the dirt. Winnie watches me for a minute, her face politely interested but dubious. She's a forensic osteologist, or whatever her department is calling them now. The drop-down menu on the funding form didn't have our real titles, but we had to put something in to get the money. She deals with trace chemicals, microscopic fragments, strands of hair, things that can be measured and tested. 
journals don't fall under the purview of what she considers real science. Well, that's great, she says, her voice as sincere as she can make it. We're meeting back at the pod, she says eventually. In 14C, I'll keep yours hot. Thanks. When she's gone, her microboard silent along the rubble strewn street, I set the book down where I found it, and on the gloves in the back pocket of my cruise vest and pick it up again. My heart is beating very fast. The rest of the team might not help me, but I'm already thinking, beg Winnie to check the gardens for bone fragments, ask Victor about the trees. What does turned mean? It's too early in the year to be referring to fall. This could be my whole degree, my whole life. Thank you. Wow. I mean, that's so intriguing because <laughs> I've not read <laughs> this, but now I'm like, but what happens next? <laughs> <laughs> what happens next is both their stories uh, continue and intertwine in interesting ways. They're from different time periods, right? I yeah, that, right? very, very different. Yeah. <laughs> okay, interesting. Are you um, are you playing with time in that one? I, I've seen a hint of the future <laughs> in the Beneath the Rising series as well that perhaps plays with time. Maybe, I don't know, <laughs> you can tell. <laughs> yeah, in this one, um, time is, I guess we'll say, running normally. Uh, the two narratives are separated, as it turns out, by about uh, 50 years. So uh, Eva, the first narrator, has written a journal. So that's what is being read by Emerson, the second narrator, because she discovers the journal when she comes back to this city um, on a research trip. And um, I don't know, I, I think it was interesting to kind of consider these two narratives kind of one set now or near now. Um, I don't think I specified the year, but they clearly had cell phones and internet and that kind of thing. And the other, um, after the end of the world, but also after the world had rebuilt itself after the end of the world. Um, and so uh, it's it's kind of fun, I think, to play with uh, history and, and expectations that way. Uh, and it's it's fun to do in uh, novella sides too, because you know it's a it's a bit premisey, it's a bit gimmicky, and I don't think that could sustain itself for a whole novel. <laughs> um, so speaking about that novella, if I've understood correctly, it's in a series of three, but with three different authors. Is that correct? It's not. Yeah, it's not a series. Um, the books aren't related to each other. They just chose uh, three novella authors as kind of the, the flagship novellas for the imprint. Um, so the only reason that they're so you know coordinated, matchy matchy, and that we've been marketing together is that uh, we're sort of the first three guinea pigs <laughs> for the imprint. And it was a coincidence that we all turned out to be Canadians. So that was kind of fun. Yeah. Um, so speaking about sort of your other works as well, could you just give an introduction for people who maybe don't know you as well to sort of some of the different series you've got going on or starting and some of the standalone works as well, just very briefly? Oh, sure. Yeah. Um, so Beneath the Rising was my debut novel, which came out in 2020, straight into the plague. And uh, that, uh, as it turns out, was supposed to be a duology. And the second book, um, a Broken Darkness, the sequel, came out this year, and um, there were some, you know, the characters have some difficulties at the end of it, and the third book in that series, The Void Ascendant, will be coming out uh, next year. So that's a series. Um, the Apple Tree Throne, which you so thoughtfully mentioned earlier, was uh, self-published by me in 2018, and um, at the moment only exists in ebook version and in uh, audio, and I should add, the Beneath the Rising series is, is cosmic horror, sci-fi, fantasy, uh, several things, actually. Um, the Apple Tree Throne is what I would call, you know, a more straightforward ghost story in kind of an alternate England. And um, yeah, These Lifeless Things is a cosmic horror that is unrelated to Beneath the Rising, but is related to a short story that came out in the Sock Dolager in 2017 called And Sneer of Cold Command. Uh, so it's actually it's actually a sidequel of that. So it's events are happening um, a couple of hundred kilometers away, but at the same time as the events in the short story, and they're not aware of the events going on, uh, which I thought was kind of fun to play with. Um, 
And in July, I have a novella coming out from Neon Hemlock Press that I'm very excited about called um, And What Can We Offer You Tonight, which is a sci-fi set in a uh, dystopian city where you literally have to work to live. Uh, if you don't work, you can be subject to government calls. And it's the story of uh, friends who have to basically choose between staying employed and alive and seeking out uh, justice for a terrible crime. And in September, I have um, the annual Migration of Clouds, uh, a book coming out with ECW Press that is kind of, uh, I guess I guess we're calling it climate fiction because I don't really feel like it's post-apocalyptic. It's, it's kind of like these lifeless things or, or Emerson's timeline in that it's post-post-apocalyptic. Um, so the post-apocalypse part already happened. <laughs> um and, and nobody went full mad max or anything and it's uh the story of a young woman uh who has an unusual illness but being given the opportunity to uh leave her community and go uh study for the first time away from it and choosing how to uh set up her family before she uh leaves or doesn't leave depending on whether she can bring herself to do it so i think that's that's it for long form <laughs> gosh I mean that's a hectic <laughs> schedule <laughs> so how do you keep up with that <laughs> I think the word we're looking for here is badly <laughs> <laughs> but um the truth is I have started saying no to things because earlier in the year I was just completely burnt out I was doing uh six or seven interviews podcasts panels, events, launches um, a week, and I couldn't actually get any writing done or deal with any of the other aspects of publishing. So uh, time management has become more important as we've gone along here. So I'm taking the time now to kind of only do the events that I really want to do, like this. <laughs> um, with your sort of, with these novels, are you writing to specs or are you kind of pitching and sort of the second part of that question is what's the sort of process that you have putting together these novels and novels? yeah see and that's really interesting because when I um started querying back in like 2000 whatever it was 17 um you know on my bucket list was uh selling a novel on proposal because I thought you know wow that's something that only really established authors must be allowed to do. Just, hey, I have an idea. And then the publisher's like, well, here's a wad of cash to make that into a novel. <laughs> uh, so that was that was the dream. Uh, be careful what you wish for. But um, so yeah, Beneath the Rising, I had finished uh, before the querying process. And that was the novel that I chose to seek representation with. And it was written as a standalone. Uh, my agent uh, pitched it to publishers as a trilogy uh, with the assumption that if they bought the trilogy, I would just write the second two books. And what ended up happening was the publisher bought two books. So that was kind of the first case where I was paid for a book that didn't exist yet. <laughs> but um, before signing the paperwork, they did ask for a synopsis of the second book. So I kind of had to know how it went. Uh, before they actually would give me the money, which, okay, fair. Fair enough, I suppose. Yeah. Um, These Lifeless Things was completed in, I think, also about 2017. Um, it was bought by a publisher, and then they broke their contract, and then it wandered around being sad for a while, and then it found a new home. So that one was already done. Um, and same with, uh, and what can we offer you tonight? I just wrote that and submitted it and uh, to their open novella call. And they were like, oh, yes, please. And, um, and uh, the annual migration of clouds was also completed. And that one had a slightly weird sale because I was at uh, Dublin Worldcon in 2019, um, standing at the con bar waiting for them to pour my cider <laughs> after having had a few ciders. And I was summarizing this novella that I'd just written to my uh, equally intoxicated friend who wasn't really paying attention. And uh, I noticed you know, someone kind of coming up next to me and she was like, hey, did someone buy that? Did someone buy that book? I was like, excuse me? <laughs> so she gave me her card and it turned out she was the acquiring editor at ECW Press. I was like, if no one's bought that manuscript, I would like to read it. 
when you get back to Canada, have your agent send me that manuscript. Wow. And she wrote it down on her business card, which was a really good idea because I would have forgotten um, the devil drink as, as sometimes happens. <laughs> but yeah, we, uh, we came back. Um, my agent ran through the manuscript quickly because he wasn't aware that I'd written it. Uh, I had actually just written it before leaving for holiday. And um, we submitted it and they bought it. So that was kind of how that one worked. And then with the third book in the Beneath the Rising trilogy, we started talking about it in about, um, I don't know, December-ish this year, December or January. So the second book was already done and actually out of edits and actually like eight weeks before publishing. And I was like, okay, well, the time to talk about the third book was while the second one was in edits. <laughs> that did not happen. So yeah, they, uh, the publisher approached me and uh, was like, well, you know, we'd like to make this a trilogy now. I'm like, oh, now you want to make it a trilogy. Yeah, <laughs> was my entire response, I think. <laughs> but uh, I wanted to write a third book. They wanted a third book. So uh, it worked out. And they also um, put their name down for some prospective other book and just threw that in the contract. So in the contract, that's called something like untitled fantasy novel. I don't know, I got paid for it. I'm gonna have to write it at some point. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's pretty amazing though. <laughs> this is kind of, yeah. I didn't know how any of this worked when I was uh, querying. Um, Cause this is the part of the process that kind of turns publishing into like a black box. Like you see people in the query trenches and they talk about it on Twitter and you know, they're doing their letters and they've got their synopses and their comps and stuff and then there's like silence and then like the book comes out you know <laughs> yes I do I see all the sort of preliminary bits on Twitter and yeah. then just a mystery then you have a book suddenly yeah yeah cool um <laughs> like 25 books in a box in your very small uh flat yeah <laughs> you have to try to figure out where to put them <laughs> <laughs> So with the, the actual sort of writing, how does that process work? Do you start with an idea? Do you, do you write very chronologically? Or... It's, uh, it varies. Yeah, it varies a lot depending on what I'm writing. Um, I used to not be an outliner and I could not help but notice that uh, that also meant that I didn't get things done. Mm -hmm. Like I would write and write and write and write and write. I would end up with like, hundreds of thousands of words but it wasn't really a thing in the shape of a novel mm. it was just like a bunch of anecdotes strung together and it didn't have an end and you know the characters in it weren't working towards an end because they didn't know what the end was they were waiting for me to figure out what the end was and then go back and edit like two hundred and fifty thousand words of filler while they were wandering in circles trying <laughs> to figure out what's happening and that that didn't work super well for me, although I enjoyed it. It's also not a style of writing that works well for me with publishing demands. So I'm an outliner now. Um, so I do usually start with um, kind of the, the premise, like the what if. Uh, this also leads me into the fact that with um, A Broken Darkness, that was the first sequel to anything I'd ever written. And I just, you know, when I realized that it was a two book deal and that meant I had to write the second book. I just sat there like, how do you write a sequel? How do you, how do people do that? I don't understand, like I've read dozens of sequels. How do I <laughs> write a sequel? So that really took some doing and a lot of index cards. <laughs> but yeah, I usually start kind of with, um, you know, with the main idea and then I sort of build out from that and I like to know uh, my preferred ending near when I start outlining so that I can work towards that and kind of as as people people characters go along characters of people uh, as as people go along um, kind of figuring out how they're going to get to this ending that they don't know exists uh, that makes it easier to kind of quietly shut doors on them or have them shut doors on themselves so that they're forced down the path to get to that ending and not a different ending you know that's the only way the story could go and that makes it a little easier to plan from the beginning to the end 
Um, and yeah, it's a, uh, it works a bit more smoothly that way, I think, because for me, it prevents like the stop, start, stop, start while I try to figure out what people, you know, are going to be doing or how they're going to get themselves out of a situation because stopping is fine, but starting again takes a huge amount of energy. So it's better if I can just go as smoothly as possible. Yeah. <laughs> I'm interested in like a couple of sort of, I don't know if themes is the right word, but a couple of motifs or something that are cropping up in a couple of your works. Like I'm interested in this idea of the post post apocalypse. <laughs> and because I mean, I don't know if there's a general debate. I certainly hear a lot kind of the sort of critique of the post apocalyptic. And um, was it sort of a deliberate decision that you didn't really want to write post apocalypse? Um, you wanted to write something, I don't know, more optimistic or what's the sort of behind the yeah, post more kind of, um, I think what it was, was that honestly, in like the 80s and 90s, I think I got a little saturated on books that were written before that were that kind of, what you'd almost call like the standard Mad Max post-apocalyptic scenario or like the post, generally post-nuclear. There were a lot of post-nuclear books. They assumed that that was the specific way the world was going to end. Um, or a meteor, that was a really common one. But either way, they all had this kind of saniness to them. They all tasted the same kind of, um, you know, that uh, it's that the world ended. There are no more rules. And um, that means that we are all going to revert to basic human nature. And what these books believe basic human nature is, is very um, power hungry and acquisitive. And it turns, uh, women into commodities and it really enforces this kind of scarcity mindset where you have to defend anything you have, um, you know, your women, your bunker, your, your farm, your animals, your canned food or whatever with, uh, with force, with lethal force, if possible, and just kill anyone that's um, going to threaten it. Um, you know, kind of things like the road where they, they come across these horrific uh, scenes of, of just brutality and murder and cannibalism. And um, I think I wanted to A, avoid writing the exact same thing that had been written a thousand times before, but B, assume that, okay, maybe actually that did happen for a little while. Maybe it did. We saw at the start of COVID that there were ridiculous things. There were riots over toilet paper. <laughs> like, people gave in to their baser instincts um, immediately. And it took a little while to kind of come out of that and realize that generally community is the way that you get out of a disaster. Um, the government may not be able to come help you and rescue you and rebuild. It's you and your neighbors and, and strangers that have to sort of pull together, find strength in numbers, find your resources in numbers. And that's the way that you are safe that's how you regain security not through violence and um there's you know there's always going to be external threats because it's the end of the world <laughs> but i felt intuitively that the first thing that people would do after the end part of the end of the world wore off was rebuild and and try to if they could make something if not better at least different from what had come before and and try to um, look after each other as, as we've been doing for millions of years. I think, yeah, it's a really interesting idea. And also, I mean, one of the other things that's quite samey to me is the, the post-apocalyptic dystopia, which um, also kind of often dwells on this idea of sort of humanity becoming its worst and also this kind of de-emotionalization like everything becomes either hyper rational or hyper acquisitive <laughs> and um so in your work we kind of working to reimagine that kind of uh, sort of text as well or that kind of kind of yeah um or or at least to say well if if that did happen if people did develop that kind of moral numbing or that kind of um extremely stringent moral or emotional response maybe those aren't the people i'm writing my story about maybe they can be acknowledged as you know oh those people that live over there those people that live up the hill maybe they're 
government officials or the new cops or whatever equivalent we've got now. But my story is going to be about the people that that didn't happen to. So maybe those people could be part of the setting. And I think I tried to sort of poke into that with, uh, and what can we offer you tonight, which is definitely a dystopia in some ways, but the most particular way that it shows itself is that there is a very, very poor girl, Jewel, the narrator, um, who, you know, gets employed in a very, very luxurious um, and, and very prestigious uh, employer and gets exposed to all the, you know, the rich people and how they live. And to them, this isn't a dystopia at all. It's just a dystopia to everybody else. And she's hyper aware that with any little slip up, that could be, you know, back where she goes. So she's not trying to become one of these rich, numb people. She's trying to hang on to it now that she thinks she's become it. That's cool. I like that sort of flipping of the dystopia. Um, that's really interesting. Um, so some other things that I have noticed and loved um, are the amount of libraries. Was this sort of like, a, well, I'm thinking of Beneath the Rising. Was this kind of like a dream fantasy library tour? Was this something that you had done? Had you, had you traveled, have you, have you been library tourism, touriseming? That's not a bad uh, <laughs> not on purpose, although when I was uh, in uh, the UK and Ireland in 2012, uh, completely involuntarily, I dragged my travel companion to a bunch of libraries. We visited uh, Trinity University in Dublin there, or Trinity Library in Dublin, and uh, I went to Oxford to check out the reading rooms stuff and the, the reading rooms at Cambridge, and he's like, why are we in the reading rooms? I'm like, I just want to, I just want to look. Because there's books and there's like lots of books and he's like, I don't know, um, you know, that it's like that uh, Jorge Luis Borges quote, uh, I have always envisioned paradise as a kind of library. That's how I envision it. Just books everywhere. Uh, as many books as have ever been written and uh, access to all the books. And not just that, but, you know, kind of what libraries also represent, um, which we which we're aware of because we all still use libraries, but we're so used to getting our information from the internet that we don't think of the internet as its own type of library either because it's a hot mess. But you know, the idea of knowledge being kind of codified and cataloged and organized so that you can find what you're looking for in it, I think is really appealing. So I always, I think throw that into my books because one of the things that many of my characters would like more than several other things is knowledge. I mean, it was interesting to me reading sort of the, your use of libraries and knowledge in your cosmic horror work, because so often I feel like, maybe I'm wrong, I feel like in cosmic horror so often more knowledge leads to madness. Oh yeah. And this was kind <laughs> of that more knowledge leads to, well, a little bit of a temporary break perhaps. Yeah. But <laughs> also knowledge is the path to success potentially. But it, you know, yeah, it's complicated. It's the past. There is mad. There's always a little bit of madness. You can't really avoid madness. It's like salt. But like, <laughs> um, but also I think hope because, um, you know, in some of the cosmic horror books, of course, yeah, you go into the library, you find the forbidden tome, you read the forbidden tome, you lose your mind instantly, and you summon some god awful horror from another galaxy. Okay, that's a bad outcome. But if the god awful horror has already arrived. Maybe there's a solution in the library, like what they do in um, the Dunwich Horror. You know, mm -hmm. they go and they look up all these books and eventually they find the recipe to make the, the powder and they find the incantation that they think will drive off. Who is it? Yog Sothoth? Some jerk. Uh, you know, the guy at the top of the hill. And um, that's the first thing they think of to do. They're like, well, we don't know how to do this and nothing we can do to this huge invisible monster will hurt it. But somebody maybe knew. And if they wrote it down, we're in luck. I just, I love that part. Do libraries everywhere. <laughs> yes, libraries everywhere, please. Like you never know when you'll need a library. There could be something horrible on top of the hill. <laughs> so with cosmic horror, like you've mentioned there, you know, a Lovecraft, obviously. Um, but how sort of, how do you um, maybe interact with cosmic horror and its history? Um, what are you trying to kind of, renew or undo 
um are you, what are your influences as well perhaps a broad question yeah <laughs> a broad question no but um it's something i think about a lot because um i actually i didn't know um read a whole lot of cosmic horror until i was kind of in my like mid-20s ish and of course you can see right from the get-go that even though there's a lot of uh, literature from around that period that just kind of throws around a lot of casual racism um uh, lovecraft was absolutely notable for having no filter between his personal racism and what he put into his stories for him those were uh plot points those were things he wanted to include and um i hated that i was like the story would have been better off not written if you are going to hang it on the idea that you know people of color or women or poor people or disabled people or um italians or whatever are not human you know like just freaking don't write it uh so i think the way to deal with that now is really to kind of not let it sort of slither back into the shadows if that makes any sense is to shine a spotlight on it and say you know if what we are doing is taking his toys from the playground and making our own playground with them we're not going to glorify or excuse what he wrote we're going to break it down and turn it around so that everyone including presumably his ghost or whatever can see that what he was doing was um you know not just unimaginative and literarily lazy but hideously bigoted along so many axes and and dehumanizing in a way that equated any group of people he didn't like with actual monsters now what i find a lot of cosmic horror is trying to do is swivel that spotlight back around and say you know what it's possible that um there are other types of monsters let's take a look at those supposing they look like people who write racist books <laughs> But yeah, very much, very much hanging a lantern and and not letting it fade into history or be excused or be softened, I think, is, is the way that I've been trying to deal with it. Yeah, I think that's a really, I mean, it's a difficult sort of field in a sense because he comes up so often, even when you wish he wouldn't. Um, yeah. Well, and he wasn't even the only person writing cosmic horror, and he certainly, certainly was not the best. I mean, it's like people have never read uh, Lord, Lord Dunsany or Algernon Blackwood or uh, Robert E. Howard. It's like all of that stuff absolutely falls into the cosmic horror bucket. And, you know, those, some of those people even corresponded with each other. And, and it's always Lovecraft's name that comes in <laughs> yeah it's a frustrating part especially because he's yeah he's not as good <laughs> yeah like he was the most racist and not the most talented yeah i think <laughs> when you read something like for me the willows by mm. algernon blackwood and you're like oh, I love oh story. that's how you do indescribable horror you oh know? my god i can't describe it it's the trees there's something wait it's not in the trees is it the trees is it something that is like behind the trees no I don't, I don't like these trees yeah, i love that story i love that story <laughs> yeah it's such a good especially because i think i read it about the same time as lovecraft and i was like no you don't need to tell me 500 times that you can't describe yeah. it you can show me that you don't yeah. need to not describe it and it's great because they absolutely do go mad because it, it is indescribable they don't know what they're dealing with i i read that and i was like i'm never going camping ever again no this is <laughs> this is terrible <laughs> I didn't need the prod if I'm honest. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, a childhood of camping and I was like, yep, that's me done. <laughs> yeah, if you're like, I'll just check that off my list. Uh, yeah. Don't need to go again. I know how it works. <laughs> yeah. um, so just before we get to sort of the last section, I'm just gonna ask about the other genres that you work in. Obviously, one of my favorites is your ghost story. Um, and that seems to be one of the sort of the earliest ones and the one that you've self published, I think. But what was, do you have this history of kind of engaging with more of the gothic and the ghost story as well? Was it a, 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 a new adventure for you to write a ghost story? It was story? a new adventure for me. Um, I just, I honestly, I, and I did get my agent's permission. I, I told him, you know, I've written this, uh, this little novella. 
I absolutely guarantee you that it would not sell if we sent it out on submission. So is it okay if I self-publish it? He was like, you have my blessing. Um, like, I think he glanced at it and was like, oh, it's nice, but yeah, it's not marketable. <laughs> Which, okay, legit. Um, he's an agent, he knows the business. But um, I had always wanted to write a um, sort of a, a sad ghost story based on the song that's mentioned at the end of the novella, The Ghost of Genova Heights by my favorite band, Stars. And it honestly had just been kind of knocking around in my head without anything to coalesce on that. You know, like, um, Ghost is so vague. Uh, I ended up kind of going back to the song and some, some parts of it struck me as vaguely both romantic, you know, the, the mention of the roses, the grave, um, the appearance at the window, uh, you know, felt a little Shakespearean almost. And I was like, oh, Shakespeare ghost story, um, but also slightly military um, because there, there's a mention of uh, told his men to turn back. And I was like, well, the place that you often see the phrase his men is you know someone in charge of a military unit so i think that's kind of where where that came out of and um i didn't really want to write kind of a bog standard war story with the necessary cruelty and um frankly colonialism and exoticism and the british empire so that's why i flipped it into an alternate britain um, you know, the greater Republic of Britannia, which allows them to call themselves grubbers in the story, which I kind of love. <laughs> and also to throw in some, you know, random little steampunk touches like, um, you know, their, uh, their hydroelectric plants around the city um, and, and that, the weird machine that executes people with a flash and, uh, you know, the radio viz, which is, um, you know, I almost pictured it as kind of like a, a primitive, like, one of those marquee signs with the rotating letters, but like little. <laughs> yeah, it was another, I guess, genre mashup. I guess I'm not interested in um, uh, genres not touching each other. I'm very interested in mushing genres together. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I can definitely see the ones that, the work that I've read by you has always been kind of a mix of, of things, but that, has always worked really well to bring out different notes. I mean, you know, we loved Apple Tree Throne in the book group. Yeah, that <laughs> and was then really Bob gratifying. Bob questions. <laughs> I, I would like to write more ghosty stuff and more gothic stuff and more um, spiritual stuff. I recently read William Hope Hodgson's um, Karnacki, The Ghost Finder, and um, I, I loved it. I was like, oh, why didn't I read this when I was younger? I could have been a ghost finder instead of a scientist. <laughs> I got to have a much better career. <laughs> Somewhere my parents are like, what did she just say? <laughs> but, um, you know, it's that whole time period is full of such interesting stuff. And of course, you know, half the stories in Karnacki, it turns out to not be a ghost anyway. But um, it is something I would like to explore more um, and write more of uh, if, I, if I can get, you know, kind of the feel and the tone Right, because I think it, it felt it felt right for the apple tree throne and part of me is going, well, what if I can't do that again? <laughs> Maybe you could do like, this is a very random reference, but there was a, a Scottish writer called Margaret Oliphant in the 19th century. And she wrote to live and she produced biographies and histories and novels and all sorts of stuff. But she also wrote for herself, her ghost stories. I mean, to published, but those are the things that she wrote because that's what she wanted to write at the time. So maybe that can be your ghosting when the, when the inspiration hits. Yeah, like, ha, I'm ready. I mean, if I if I can scrape some time out from the the, the contracted stuff, because you know, uh, that, I think that was another thing I didn't realize when I was uh, after the book deal was kind of um, writing for fun or writing for myself is no longer a thing. The priority goes. Um, you know, writing that I'm already paid for, writing that I promised I'd do, but I haven't yet been paid for, and then writing for myself if I have any energy or time left. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, hopefully the, the schedule will open up a little bit soon and let me poke into some interesting Victorian ghosty, gothic-y stuff. I, I would like to write a haunted house story. I have one um, in my ideas folder ready to go, and it's just a haunted house that kind of breaks all the the little rules that we've set up in our heads for haunted houses and it knows it so one day one day 
I mean, you've just mentioned it, so I will just quickly ask. But to what extent are your books influenced by your science, your science past? That's so vague, I'm sorry. <laughs> it, it would have been more if I'd read Karnacki at the appropriate time. No, but it's, uh, it varies a lot. It varies a lot. Um, yeah, I uh, coming from a science background, I think people assume right off the bat that all I must write must be science fiction because I want all my stuff to be steeped in science. But it's... Um, it's more, I think, that where it comes through is that I'm interested in science as a whole, not just um, the areas that I studied. And the, the two degrees also kind of gave me the ability to crunch up a lot of scientific information in an unfamiliar field really quickly and fictionalize it in a way that feels um, convincing, if not real. <laughs> and I think that's, that's, the, that's the key with fiction, it's just be convincing, it doesn't have to be real. Um, as, as well as, you know, interesting places to find research and ways to vet research to see if it's, you know, reasonably, uh, you know, if it'll stand up to scrutiny, as well as to read speculative things that people write about, you know, oh, here's what we think the future is going to look like in XXX years and kind of see what kind of a job they did with their extrapolation. And also to make connections between unrelated fields of science, which I think definitely ended up happening in um, the annual migration of clouds, where I was looking both at climate science and also at this strange new disease, which is one of the issues that causes all the problems in the book. And I was like, well, how can I, how can I get them to kind of feed off each other? Um, or can I, or, or should I? Is, you know, is that a connection that I think I want to make in, in text? Or is that something I want to kind of leave um, implied. So a great deal of influence, but not a great deal of explicit influence, I think. <laughs> makes sense. I felt like reading your books, they felt sciencey, but not too complicated for somebody like me who, who gave up science many, many years ago. <laughs> um, so yeah, do you know what I mean? Like they felt sciencey accessible, like you had fictionalized it in a way that was, um, you know, Read, well, I think, thank you. I hope so. Yeah, um, that, that's especially tricky with Beneath the Rising because one of the main characters in the first two books is someone who is on page much, much smarter than me. And um, I'm not making that mistake yet. Never write a character that's way smarter than you. <laughs> They'll have to say some really smart things. <laughs> they, I mean, they did sound very smart. <laughs> yeah, she, she sounds really convincing again. <laughs> I just really confident. She speaks with a lot of confidence. And as I'm writing there, I'm like, yeah, you know, she's she's really selling it. I almost believe this. Thanks, <laughs> Beth. <laughs> it's these days. Um, so thank you so much for time. Let us finish with the roundup questions, which are the same for everybody, <laughs> more or less. Um, my question, the first one is, what was the book or text, any type of text, so film or TV series or, or song even, that got you into sort of horror? Um, as a genre? Uh, aliens, I think, because I think, um, or, or Alien maybe even, but let's say the first two movies, because they to me, I think, sort of codified what I thought of as a horror movie that was sci-fi and an action movie that was scary in sci-fi. Mm -hmm. um, so let's say Alien. Um, I watched it, I think, way too young. <laughs> Like, I had no business watching it as young as I was, and I was horrified. I had nightmares for probably weeks, and I didn't even see the full movie for, I, I saw like two thirds of it at a friend's house. Um, I didn't even see the full movie for like uh, another probably couple of years. It just, and it stuck in my memory, like it had been branded. <laughs> cool. Yeah, it was also when I watched Far Too Young. Um, and I haven't watched it for years because I'm still a little bit scared. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. I, I I love it. I'm obsessed with it. I keep a I keep a xenomorph on my desk to inspire me to like not go on spaceships. <laughs> <laughs> I learned that lesson. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, um, no camping. No spaceships. There we go. Um, see, informing our viewers <laughs> these key facts. <laughs> Um, the second question of the three is, um, what are some of the authors that have either inspired you or you think have maybe influenced you or sort of have marked your path into the genre somehow? Hmm. 
Um, God, yeah, I read a lot of Stephen King when I was young, which I think is the standard answer for sure. Um, I don't like him, I'm sorry. Yeah, he's, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> there was a point where I was like, a lot of these books are feeling a little samey, but those were the really kind of early ones. Um, I read a lot of Pratchett, um, naturally, I guess. Uh, I love William Gibson, uh, Umberto Eco, uh, Ismael Kadare, and um, I'm probably pronouncing his name wrong, but uh, Kadare writes books that he probably would think are not horror, and they really have a lot of horror elements, though, and supernatural elements, but they're written about just kind of with the mythology of Albania, and that's to me kind of also like um, Toni Morrison's Beloved, which I don't think is marketed as a horror book. Mm -hmm. And it is really, really scary. Um, I fully consider that a horror book and, and a huge influence, you know, kind of the horror of the past that you can't get rid of. Um, uh, yeah, de definitely all those guys. Um, I don't read a ton of horror. I find it quite scary. I mean, as you're supposed to. But. <laughs> <laughs> I know, but for, for two people who sort of live by horror, I also yeah. don't read much horror. <laughs> it's scary. If people have people consider that it's too scary to read. Um, oh, yeah. a great one I read the other day. Uh, John Langan's *The Fisherman*. Um, yeah. Cosmic horror, but wrapped up in this really, uh, this really kind of uh, meaningful, sensitive human story about kind of two types of grief. Um, just really well done. Uh, that, like that that's the kind of horror I can kind of manage <laughs> I think yeah I just didn't really grow up even reading a lot of horror I definitely am more the gothic side you know mm -hmm. and I've always felt like a bad <laughs> horror person because I don't like Stephen King and I always feel like I have to admit it in a whisper because I'm like I'm in the <laughs> world just... no I think I think we're just allowed to like what we like and just because someone has written like the most kind of like by volume <laughs> out of every year out of all the horror people doesn't mean that we can't have, you know, our own individual tastes. <laughs> True. Um, the last question, a little bit left field, but we'll see what you could do. It's a five point question. Well, no, I'm asking for five examples. So five films that you think give a good insight into your tastes. So that ah, okay. Um, I am one of those people who obsessively re-watches movies and will re-watch a movie an hour after I have just finished watching it. So I, I feel like I should be able to come up with one here uh, fairly fast. Blazing Saddles, um, Mortal Kombat, Aliens, uh, Ralph Bakshi's Wizards, <laughs> um, what's another? Dread. The, the new one? A new one. A yeah, new I really loved it. I don't know. I've watched it like a zillion times now. <laughs> I've only watched it once, I think. I've watched <laughs> I've, to my discredit, probably. I've watched the, the other one a lot. <laughs> like, I got stuck in the 80s. What can I say? 80s and 90s. <laughs> 80s and 90s, like action. I barely sorcery. remember the earlier one. Uh, I'm trying now to think if I actually saw I'm pretty sure I saw that one, but I think my brain was just like, hop. And just tossed it out the window when the new one came along. <laughs> fair, fair. It was. I mean, it was very good. I just. Yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> um, I think it's because it's so dark that I haven't watched it as much. Yeah, know? it's pretty dark. It's very, it's very dread, 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 dready. It's very mm. comic booky. <laughs> yes. Um. Anyway, um, thank you so much, um, yeah, Amy, for joining yeah, us. So I will. Um, thank you once again and stop recording. Bye, everyone. Thank you.